feel that right now if you can crack a funny joke. Maybe funny, a little funny. It is kind of, it is kind of a pastor joke in that edition, right? Well, good morning, good morning, everybody. Uh, oh, I heard one. I heard one. Good morning, everyone. And happy Lord's Day and happy New Year. Yep, good to see you, everybody, in this new year, as, as Carly uh, made me aware that I haven't seen you all uh, since last year, so it's been a while, so uh, exactly. Uh, good to see everyone this morning, and uh, for those of that are visiting, we've got some visitors, seeing Nikki and, and his uh, family here from Haiti, so we enjoy having them, and some visitors, uh, we've got Luis in town, and so always good to have you in town with us, and so, so good to see everyone, and I know we've got several who are missing and still coming in, but... Uh, we are here to celebrate and to worship our risen Lord today together. Uh, we have a pretty much uh, the week as usual for as far as Bible studies and things go, men on Monday night, uh, ladies on Wednesday night. Uh, one thing that we want to speak of right now real quick is we will have a meeting next Sunday uh, on the 9th after service uh, for anyone who is interested to uh, serve in music ministry. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit at the uh, family meeting that we had a couple weeks ago. And so some of the prerequisites, you can come and talk to us afterwards if you're interested, but some of those prerequisites are uh, 16 and over. Uh, but if you are 16 and over and have uh, interest and Lord willing talent and giftedness uh, in, in things of music, we would certainly love to uh, discuss what the future of music ministry looks like here at, uh, at First Baptist. And so uh, look forward to that uh, conversation and, and uh, maybe we can even start some of that at, at lunch that we have afterwards because this is the first Sunday of, uh, of the month and of the year, right? And so we have uh, Lord's Supper and communion that we'll be celebrating together here, and we will then have fellowship lunch following. So if you are able, please stay in, in uh, fellowship for lunch, and if you brought something, that's great. I saw a lot of good food up there already going, so uh, I'm getting hungry already. But go ahead and stand to your feet, please, if you will, and we will get started with our service here and our call to worship. And the first song we're going to sing this morning is uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. This song was written by uh, the great reformer, Martin Luther, who God used to do great things in the 16th century. He wrote this song in the early uh, 1500s, and actually it was in a, a pretty uh, solemn time in, in things that were going on with the Black Plague and the area in which he was living in. Uh, but this, uh, this song is just so rich uh, and deep in theological principles and truths. And you guys know that that's important for us, and, and so this is a great song. But this song comes from, uh, the, the thoughts and, and the uh, theology behind it comes from Psalm 46. And so I'm going to read that as our call this morning. It says, For the choir director, a psalm of the son, sons of Korah set to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roam and roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear into two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Amen. And so that's where the, the thought of this mighty fortress comes from. And even as it said there, the Lord of hosts, uh, Lord Sabaoth is, is in this song. And so that may be a phrase that you're not very familiar with, the Lord Sabaoth. And that simply means the Lord of hosts. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's sing here to the Lord this morning as we begin our worship.
his kingdom is forever. Amen, indeed. Praise the Lord. That's right. That is worthy of our praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Psalm 103, verse 8. 
The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. What a great name. Amen. Great, great truth of his word. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Jay. Well, good morning. What an incredible blessing that our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. It's just uh, hard to fathom that God removes all our, our trespasses and just so grateful for that. Well, uh, now's the time in our service where we're going to worship through giving. I'm going to read a verse here from James uh, just to remind us where everything we have comes from. This is James chapter 1, uh, verse 17. Every good, and gi- every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. What a, an incredible promise that uh, these gifts that he's given us are good and perfect gifts. Uh, and we're just so grateful. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for all of the gifts that you give us. Um, Lord, I, I know many times I, I'm not focused as much as I should be on the things that you do for us every day, even the small things. Father, we thank you for those, and Lord, uh, we just want to give back to you today some of what you have given us that uh, we may share the gospel uh, here in the Upper Keys. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a plate in the back, and there's also one up here on the stage.
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. You may be seated. And bear with me one moment as we transition here in our service. We are going to partake of the Lord's Supper here together this morning. Yeah, you left your Bible up here, so I'm using it. <laughs> and I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You can certainly go there if you would like to. This morning as we come to the Lord's table, uh, just a few things uh, that we do recognize what a lot of churches call an open table. Uh, so it, you do not have to be a member of this church or come to this church in order to partake of the Lord's Supper uh, with us. Uh, the prerequisite that we have is the one that we see in the scriptures, which is that you be a believer and profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so as we do that, uh, let's go to the scriptures and see uh, what Paul says here in the 11th chapter of his first letter to the Corinthians, beginning in verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And so I stop there to say, Paul gives us actually stern warning here, does he not? Uh, when we come to the Lord's table, we often uh, think of, and rightly so, the celebration that it is, right? And recognition of what the Lord has done for us on the cross some 2,000 years ago. And so we certainly come to that and we have fellowship uh, with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and co-heirs with Christ. But also there is this warning uh, that Paul gives. And so he says not to partake of this in an unworthy manner. And so as we often take opportunity when we do the Lord's Supper to teach, uh, remember that taking of, of an unworthy manner and partaking in an unworthy manner, what would that be? That would be if you are outside of Christ. If you do not profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and do not recognize him as Savior, then I would say to you this morning, do not partake of this. Just just sit there in your pew, and there's certainly no judgment. No one's looking around at that. Uh, we pray certainly that you would come to profess and proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Uh, but also, uh, that would be to an unbeliever. But I, I believe there are times in a believer's life where we may be feeling unworthy to partake of communion together with, with the Lord and with each other. And so perhaps there is uh, some unprofessed sin in, in your life, an unconfessed sin. So perhaps there's a, a struggle that you're dealing with in a, a time of your life where you feel that your fellowship with the Lord is not where it should be. Well, I would say to you what Paul says here, to examine yourself, uh, to confess these sins, that it, we're going to take a, a couple moments here to just do, in, in fact, that, that as we go to a couple moments of silence, uh, to sit in prayer, to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you uh, sinful things in your life that you would recall these things and and to confess them to repent them to, to Christ and we understand that if we believe in Christ we have been forgiven right first John 1 9 says if we uh, ask him for forgiveness he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins but we continue to confess and to repent of our sins why not to be continually forgiven again right but it's for the fellowship that we have with the Lord so that we could be in a right relationship with the Lord, so that our relationship with him would be close as we desire for it to be, as he desires it to be. And so we need to remove any sin uh, that is in the way of that and in the way of us having proper fellowship with, with our Lord. And so let's go ahead and, and take this time, and we'll come back together in a few minutes to partake.
as we come back together now to to partake. Uh, you've got the cups right there in front of you. I know most of you are familiar with those by this time, but they can be a little sticky sometimes. <laughs> be careful taking and peeling those things back, or uh, you might spill some grape juice all over you, but Lord willing, it'll wash out and be okay. Thank you, Jay. If there's any more that need, uh, we've got some more here that Jay will pass out. So go ahead and peel back that first layer. It exposes the bread, and we will take that now. So this was the night of Jesus' betrayal. That next day, uh, his body would be broken. He would be put upon the cross for the sins of all of us who believed in him. And it says, that night when he had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. Now if you can peel back that second layer. Verse 25 says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the reason we celebrate this ordinance, the reason we recognize the Lord's Supper and, and call it, in fact, the Lord's Supper. We think of that night of your betrayal as we have the accounts written for us in your word in the Gospels. And we know the, the agony and the anguish that you went through, Lord, as you went to the cross, as you left the confines of heaven, leaving behind your throne and taking on flesh to become like us, to pay the price for a debt that you did not owe because we could not pay the price. So, Lord, thank you for your great love in which you've chosen to love us. And Lord, we do remember that, and I pray that it wouldn't be just on the first Sunday of the month as we partake here together of the elements, but that it would be every day, that this would be continually before us, that we would remember you and remember what you've done and recognize uh, the cost of our sin. It is a high cost, and the ultimate cost, the ultimate price was paid by you for us, and so Lord, we thank you for that. We celebrate your victory over death, over sin, over Satan, over hell, over all our enemies. We know that they are real enemies. Uh, our adversary we know is cunning, uh, but we are not uh, to be fearful of him and to be mindful of him. He is a defeated foe, as we just spoke of. And so, Lord, we thank you for that because the victory is yours and the victory is ours in you. That because you have overcome, we are overcomers. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. As we come to uh, the time of the preaching, the proclamation of your word, Lord, and Pastor Brian comes forward, uh, Lord, we just ask that you would open our minds and our eyes. I think of Paul's prayer uh, to the Ephesians in chapter 1, also likewise uh, to the church at Colossae, that you would open the eyes of, of our hearts to be enlightened, that you would grant us uh, greater revelation, that you would grant us wisdom and knowledge and understanding of your ways, uh, and not just to be filled with, with head knowledge, that, that we would uh, be puffed up or arrogant in any way, but that we would use it, that we would find practical application in it, that we would be molded, that we would be shaped by your word, that your spirit would continue to work in us, to, to build us, and to shape us to be more like you, to be less like us. Think of Paul's words in, in Philippians 1, and, and thank you for this work that you've begun in us, that you promised to complete one day. We look forward, Lord, to that perfected sanctification, that state which we will one day be in when we see you with our own eyes, when our faith will no longer be by faith, but by sight. And we look forward to that day. We look forward to the day of the Lord in which you will come back uh, to receive us unto yourself, Lord. And we know that you are preparing a place for us and that our names are written in your book. And God, for any of those who are not here this morning, who may not know you or recognize you yet as Lord and Savior, we pray that that day would be today. We pray that as the truth of your gospel is proclaimed here this morning, you, Lord, are the one who can open eyes to, he to see. You are the one, Lord, who can open ears to hear. Lord, you are the one. Your spirit is the one that causes us to be born again, as Peter says. Lord, that you would remove the heart of stone 
and replace it with a heart of flesh, that you would change us, that you would change our families, you would save our families, our, our loved ones, all those around us, Lord, that you would ignite an awakening, a great awakening, a revival, a reformation in this place in the Florida Keys, and that you would start it in our families right here. We ask all these things today and a blessing upon your word for edification for your people and the exaltation of your name. Jesus, amen. Amen. If you have someone six or under that would like to go to the other building, they're excused now. For the rest of us, I invite you to stand for the reading God's word if you're able. If you have a six and under that would like to stay for the preaching of the word, I would love for them to stay. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Thus ends the reading of God's Word. You may be seated. The week before Christmas is full of excitement, joy, kindness, anticipation, hope. It's perhaps one of my favorite weeks of the year. I always try to get vacation the week before Christmas just to be able to experience all that there is. And then once Christmas passes, I, I never let it go easily. Uh, Heather's gracious to keep the tree and the decorations up till after New Year's so I can hold on just a little bit longer. And so I'd like to hold on to that gift of gifts that we celebrate for, for one more week, obviously, is... We read Isaiah 9, 6, but I recognize we're also obligated to acknowledge uh, the beginning of a new year, 2022, the year that 2-22-22 falls on a Tuesday, making it a no-joke Tuesday, 2022, did you know that? That's good, that's real, that's going to happen. And I don't know when the last time it did happen or ever will happen again. You can research that and let me know. But it's kind of, it may be unique, an actual once. There you go. Um, it's also the year marking two full years of dealing with COVID-19. And uh, really, that perhaps is what provoked this sermon in my mind more than anything. The, the second title I had for this sermon was Persevering the Prolonged Pandemic and Other Problems. As I just thought through and occasionally watched the news, but I settled on the Prince of Peace from Isaiah 9-6, the Christmas message. As I thought about us uh, persevering the prolonged pandemic, I thought about the word fear, and so by definition, fear is a painful emotion or passion excited by an expectation of evil or the apprehension of impending danger. And we have seen much propagating of apprehension of potentially impending danger every time I see a news broadcast. I'm, I'm faced with the opportunity, it seems, to buy some more apprehension. And over the course of two years, I have seen what may be accurately described as fear fatigue, as we've been bombarded with so much negativity. And I think of our ability to manage fear like a rubber band and you know rubber bands only have so much elasticity and they can only be stretched and shot across the room at somebody's eye so many times not recommended crew not supposed to do that safety goggles always in a rubber band war and and sometimes when we get fear fatigued then 
we, are, we become easily provoked. Uh, to be provoked is to be aroused to anger or wrath. And I think sometimes maybe it's a self-protection mechanism. Like, I, I can't handle any more fear, and so I want to strike out like a threatened or injured animal to protect myself from any more apprehension of danger. But, you know, God doesn't call us to be quickly aroused to anger or wrath, to, to defend our position, whatever yours is, on, on the virus or the vaccine or the pandemic or the economy. I, I've heard every position there is, and I've heard them articulated with great passion and fervor as if it were the only position to hold. So I'm not going to cover any of those positions because I don't want to provoke you. But the Prince of Peace, all of our encouragement, all of our hope, all of our comfort, rightly and appropriately, finds its foundation in Christ, the Prince of Peace. And so that's the heart of your pastor this morning. I'm wanting to share with you God's truth in the beginning of this year, that it might be a year of peace no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what happened yesterday, no matter what you may be tempted to fear in the future, may God's word and the Prince of Peace himself be our focus for this new year. Peace, by definition, is harmony, concord, a state of reconciliation between parties at variance. Christmas Eve we looked at Luke chapter 2, verse 14. The heavenly host said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. In that verse we see peace with God. Now, you may be tempted to read that in a sense that uh, because these people did something to please God, they had peace with him. But that, in fact, is not what the Greek text says. It says, quote, men of his good pleasure, end quote, meaning God placed his pleasure on men and women, boys and girls, and those with whom he gave special pleasure, he is giving them peace with him. They are redeemed, reconciled, saved, no longer the enemies of God, believers, Christians, possessors of saving faith. And I assume that that is most of you here this morning, gathered on the Lord's Day for corporate worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ on this first Lord's Day of 2022. And so I want you to let that sink in. At the very beginning, let it sink into your heart and mind that his favor rests upon you, his child. And that no past performance has qualified you for that good pleasure that he has given you. No present performance is going to save you. No future performance is going to condemn you. Because Jesus paid it all. You are a free person at peace with God through the Prince of Peace, Christ the Lord. That's the gospel. And I find that it benefits me to preach that to myself early and often and daily. To resist some of the other inputs in my life. And when I meditate on that gospel truth, like the heavenly host, I am compelled to say glory to God in the highest. Great things he has done. That's peace with God from the Prince of Peace. And that should be our first order of business in 2022. If you have not come to the place of faith, repenting of your sins, turning from your way, living for yourself and your own agenda, and turning to the one true and living God, the Lord Jesus himself, that's first and foremost for the year. But for those of us who are in Christ by faith, having received his good pleasure from the Prince of Peace, then the second definition of peace is freedom from agitation, 
or disturbance by the passions as from fear, terror, anger, anxiety, or the like, quietness of mind, tranquility, a calmness, quiet of conscience, peace. And we find this type of peace in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God is a lesser but nevertheless significant byproduct of peace with God. Inner tranquility of the soul, a confident trust like the strongest army guarding your precious heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That inner peace that gives you the ability to be a light in this world where God has left you in the middle of a pandemic and all sorts of things that you disagree with or complain about. But God is saying he offers us peace of mind here on earth and so, perhaps for the Christian, that is at the top of our list for 2022. Living daily in the peace of God. Walking in tranquility of our souls, no matter what the circumstances may be. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 23, he says this, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. Isaiah 26, 3. Let's be honest, shall we? We're amongst family and friends. Our minds are often not stayed upon him. That's my reality. I suspect that is your reality. This week, I had the privilege of being with my dad for his open heart surgery. And uh, it was often hard to keep hold on perfect peace for me. Time that passes and, and the mind in the hospital waiting, not being able to be in the operating room with the doctor, and that surgery is like four and a half hours. And, and time seems to stand still. And when it does, the mind wanders, it drifts, and it what ifs. But God says, my peace is available when your mind is stayed upon me, when you trust in me, the giver of life, the great physician, the one who's numbered our days before there's ever one. This is the God who's in charge and who's provided a skilled surgeon and whose life your dad's hands are in, so it, does that bring any peace to your mind? Yes, it, it does, and it did. And, and, but then after, after the surgery and all was well, and they only had to do two bypasses instead of three, and his mitral valve was in good shape, so they didn't have to work on that, and oh, that's wonderful. But then comes other opportunities to <laughs> distract my mind. On Wednesday morning, as I drove to the hospital, I found myself going over all the factors and requirements necessary for him to leave the intensive care unit to go to the step-down unit. And so we have to um, manage the pain meds at certain intervals, and hopefully they can be stretched out so that his blood pressure can get under control so that he doesn't have to have nitroglyceride to control that. And all the while, we have to keep our eyes on the blood sugar because that has to be less than 140 in order for him to go over there because in the intensive care unit, you have constant watching eyes of qualified medical professionals. And I got all jumbled up again and, and, and com complicated that. To, I had the opportunity to be somewhere else on Wednesday night to to be at the airport, to maybe arrive at the same time. My younger son's fiance was arriving to spend time with them. And, and I just wondered, Lord, where do I get to minister today? Who do I get to love today? And, and I found myself a little stressed out about it. And he said, well, what does the scripture say? The Lord, many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. And so I said, okay, 
I'm going to find out later on throughout the day who you want me to minister to. Who, who do I get the privilege of loving today? I'll find out later. Well, good news. Uh, he got to move to the step-down room. Uh, uh, and, and so I had the opportunity uh, after a few days to come back home. And so I was excited for a moment. Until I got on Interstate 75 and the rain started to pour down so heavily. And the Maps app turned red with traffic at a standstill due to an accident. And I thought, oh man, am I going to make my flight to get home? And so once again, my mind, instead of being stayed on the sovereign Lord of the universe who was directing my steps, was focused on the rainy, slippery, accident-trodden road ahead. And I began to wander. And I thought, where is the peace of God? It has once again escaped me. All in the matter of just a few hours. And I'm supposed to be the one who has all this memorized so that I can share and encourage you. But I am a sheep just like you in need of a savior, in need of the constant attention in the intensive care unit of faith by the Prince of Peace, the great physician himself. So I, I assume that's your reality as well. I read Boston University School of Public Health published uh, research two months ago that said pre-pandemic depression levels among American adults was at 8.5% jumping to 27.8% in 2020 and 32.8% in 2021. In other research, I read Jeremiah Johnston state that there was an over 30% increase in 2020 and a 51% increase in 2021 with inpatient hospitalization ages 12 to 18 for actual suicidal plans, not thoughts, plans that they had to take their own life, ages 12 to 18. Those types of things are in my mind when I think about what, is God, what do God's people need encouragement on, and my mind comes to peace. We all need encouragement to be at peace with God and then to experience the peace of God. We desperately need that. And so the second question I ask myself, do we as humans have challenges with our minds? And listen to me, the answer is every single one of us. Every single one of us. So there ought to be some size of relief in that. You are not alone. You are not the only person who has challenges in your mind with your thoughts, with your anxiety, with your challenges, with your difficulties. We all are alike in that regard. You're not alone. We are in this together, and you are going to be okay. <laughs> because God said he's never going to leave you or forsake you. God said he, he's never going to put you in a situation that is too much for you. He's always going to provide a way. And of course, he has done that in Christ. You are not going to lose your eternal salvation. That is not possible for the believer. He will hold you. I don't care what you feel. Sometimes your feelings can be misleading. The facts of the scripture are that once God grabs you, he will forever hold you. Christians have and do commit every sin there is, except for one. The unpardonable sin, which is unbelief, the rejection of Christ. The Christian can't commit that. But every other sin, murder, adultery, suicide. Yes, a Christian can commit those sins. And they have. And we have documented proof of those things throughout the scripture. Now that's not good and we shouldn't settle for those things. We should aim for the standard of God's word and just because our brothers and sisters who have gone before us have committed those sins that's no excuse for us to follow in their path and do the same thing but rather we should press on to what God has called us to do so in spite of the fact that we are all in scenarios where we're challenged in our mind and tempted to depression and sin that is not where he has called us to stay the Prince of Peace has called us to stay and be guarded in his perfect 
peace. And so, in light of what I assume are our answers to those two questions, in 2022, I'm inviting you to pursue peace with me. Pursuing peace and freedom from fear in 2022 and always. And so, for this, I want to focus in Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 and 9. Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That's verse 8. So, next slide peaceful processing. How do we think? That's the application. Of verse 8. Next slide, please. Peaceful processing. So, in our pandemic example, it's generally understood that uh, the fear of death is at the top of the list for greatest fears. And we've, again, been exposed to that over and over for two years about the potential that a virus can take your life. And so as we think about death, I I think about Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Christ, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who, through the fear of death, were, past tense, subject to lifelong slavery. Lifelong slavery to the fear of death. Is it any surprise to you that the newscast is what it is? No, it's no surprise. Because the scriptures tell me that every human outside of Christ is subject to lifelong slavery to death. It's what they fear at the top of their list every day of their lives. It's their focus. They can't help it. Hebrews 9, 27 says, And just as is appointed for man to die once, after that comes the judgment. There's also this reality that once you do experience physical death, you are going to meet God and you will be judged for eternity. There's a reason why the fear of death is at the top of the list. But, the Apostle Paul A few chapters earlier, Philippians chapter 1, he said, For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. (laughs) That's the opposite of what we've been talking about, right? How, How does he get to that point where he's living his Christian life day in and day out in such a way that he can say, Everyone else, this is at the top of their list, number one fear, but for me, death? That is gain, are you kidding me? Don't throw me into that briar patch. Well, I think it's because of how he thinks. Peaceful processing. If you think about your mind as a computer processor and how you deal with all the inputs that come in through your senses, that affects your level of peace. So he tells us in Philippians 4, 8, whatever... True. He, he gives us a list of things to think about. What's true? It, COVID-19, if I get it, I might die. You might. Or you might die from a million other causes. And it might be today. It might be tomorrow. I don't know. What's true? What's true is... God formed me in my mother's womb. God determined exactly how many days I would live before there was one. God says, I'm never going to allow anything to come into your life that isn't part of my perfect plan in perfect timing. So as I think about those truths, then that helps me to say, okay, yeah. You know what? I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to stop picking my nose so much. I can do those things, and then that'll be good. But what I'm not going to do is live my life in fear that I might get a respiratory virus and die. That's not profitable, and it's 
not worth my time. So I'll take what's good, and then I'll apply the truth, and I'll move on. Whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, lovely, commendable. Do you get the sense of these things? Filling your mind with these true and positive things instead of the woe is me and the stock market's down and they chose the wrong policy again and I told you you shouldn't have voted for that one and put them in the office and on and on and on and endless the ranting and the provoking goes to where you're filled with wrath and anger and God is saying but I'm offering you my peace <sighs> that surpasses all understanding that gets you thinking about the truth of God's word that, that he is God, I am not. That my shoulders are so tight and I'm so exhausted as I try to hold on to everything, manipulate all the things around me so that I can control what happens. And God's saying, um, that's my job. I'm the one orchestrating all things at all times for his glory and our good, and our good happens to be sanctification, being molded into Christ's likeness. So Paul tells the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Oh yeah, that's right. Death doesn't have victory, so why would I fear a defeated foe? I wouldn't. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. If I'm so interested in my life, then the secret to success is to hmm, live for Jesus. Do everything for him. Be willing to lose my life for his sake. That's how I protect my life. That's how I gain my life. Living for Jesus. So, peaceful processing, how we think about things. The filter that we take all of these inputs in life and put them through. It has to be the Word of God. And in order to have a fine mesh filter, you need to spend time in God's Word. Daily. And oftentimes a day. And as much as you can. Encourage one another with the truth of God's Word. Listen to God's Word through audio as you're driving somewhere. That helps in our peaceful processing. Because if, if you don't have a, a fine mesh filter, your, your filter is, you know, once a week you're getting God's word, you got big holes in your filter and a lot of lies are passing through. And you're believing those lies as if they were true because you don't have the truth of God's word to filter them out and say, no, no, that's, I know they said that, <laughs> That doesn't line up with God's word, so therefore it's not true. So therefore I'm going to discard that into the waste pile. And I'm going to stick with the excellent, the honorable, the commendable, the true things. Okay. In verse 9, next point. Practice peacefulness. So we, we think about things peacefully according to the truth. But how do we practice peace in our everyday lives? He says in verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the Apostle Paul wrote more books in the New Testament than any other author. So we've heard a lot from him. But we got to take time to read it. Then he says, practice these things. That's why I say practice peace. He says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So I see by way of application that he's saying you can't just want peace. You can't just wish peace. You have to practice peace. How do we practice peace? By doing all the things we've read in his word. There are many things to fear. Evildoers, evil, sin, the dark, <laughs> you know, night light. And, and should we ignore these things? No. I don't think we're called to ignore frightening things. We're just called to respond in a way that is in line with the truth. 
Remember Peter said uh, in speaking about Sarah and how great she was, and, and he said, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. They seem to be the opposite response. You can either do good or you can fear all those things in your life that are frightening. Death is frightening in my humanity, yes. I've never experienced it before. I don't know what it's going to be like exactly. And so, yeah, I, I could be a little afraid of it. I have an option. Peter continues in that same chapter 3. And, and he switches. He's focusing on the fear of other people. And... and the conflict that we have with them, especially when we're walking faithfully with the Lord. He says, but, but who is there to harm you in verse 13? If you're zealous for what is good, again, this description of we as Christians are doing good. Verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So suffering is going to be a normal part of 2022. Just because you have inner peace doesn't mean you're not going to be suffering. We are going to be suffering for sure. That is life, this side of heaven. But he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Being troubled would be the opposite of peace. It would be the opposite of tranquility in your heart and soul, calmness. He said, yeah, you're going to have resistance. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have suffering. But don't be troubled on the inside. But in your hearts, rather, that's on the inside, verse 15, honor Christ the Lord as holy, setting him apart, focusing on him, having your eyes on the Prince of Peace, the giver of peace. In Romans chapter 13, again, this notion of practicing peace by doing good, Paul says, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. If you're going on vacation and you're fearing getting a speeding ticket, then the practical application is to do good. Do the right thing. Go the speed limit and you won't have to be looking for the police officer who's there to punish bad. So by doing good and practicing good, it helps to be at inner peace instead of having high blood pressure on getting caught for doing wrong. Seems simple. Why do I sometimes forget it? Another definition, courage, bravery, intrepidity, that quality of mind which enables men to encounter danger. Are we going to encounter danger in 22? Yes. Encounter danger and difficulties with firmness or without fear or depression of spirits. 32.8% in 21 people diagnosed, adults, Americans with depression. It's real, it's serious. Another definition, confidence. A trusting or reliance, an assurance of mind or firm belief in the integrity, stability, or veracity of another. Who would that other be for you, Christian? Christ alone. Or in the truth and reality of a fact. And you have many facts, many truths in your mind from the Word of God to fall back on to give you confidence. And so I say we can gain confidence over fear as we practice peace through our circumstances. Paul said in Romans, um, I'm sorry, Philippians 1, 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The brothers becoming confident in the truth because of Paul's circumstances. So that tells me you and I can encourage one another. If you, in the struggles and trials that you're going to face in 22, deal with them in accordance with God's truth and God's word, I'm going to observe you and I'm going to gain confidence in my faith, as I see you living out your faith in your difficult circumstances of today. You're a blessing to me. God uses you as an encouragement to me as I watch you walk in peace, as you do good and think about things that are true and lovely and excellent and process the things that you're receiving and the circumstances in, the, in your life in accordance with God's word. I will gain confidence over fear through circumstances. 
And then we also gain confidence over fear through the truth. Paul says in Romans 8, 15, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Remember, everyone's in lifelong slavery to fear outside of Christ. That's, that's why they, they're not nice to you all the time. That's why they don't treat you like you should be treated. That's why even when you're trying to be kind, they lash out against you. Because they're scared. They're afraid. But, but you, Christian, you have not received the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear where, where we all once walked and we all can understand what that's like to be in fear. And we're still tempted to it. That's why Paul's reminding us, hey, I know, I know you're very comfortable. You're very familiar with fear and what it's like to walk in that. And you've done it a lot before. You've got a lot of practice. You're kind of good at it. But that's not what we're called to do anymore. We're called to be walking in peace. And so he said, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, that's daddy, father. <laughs> so fear may be where you are, but that is not where God has called you to stay. And, and we get out of that by crying out, Daddy, get me out of this pit. Father, lift me out of here. Remind me what I read yesterday in your word about what's true. My eyes are perceiving this, but that doesn't compute. That doesn't connect. Your word says this, so I want to believe that, but that's not what your word says, so i got to ignore that and stay in your word. When pilots encounter weather, they have to turn their focus solely on the instruments. Normally, it's a blue sky, we see the horizon, we see the runway, we make our adjustments to all the controls to land smoothly. But when the clouds are there, you can't see out the windshield. You don't know what's going on. And so you have to look at the instruments and the electronics say, well, this is where you are and this is how high you are and this is how fast you're going and this is how close you are to the runway. And if you take your eyes off of that and you look outside and you just see clouds, boy, that, that blood pressure just shoots up and you're like, I'm going to crash because I don't, I don't know whether the pull up, push down, go faster, go slower. I don't know where I'm at. But when I turn my eyes to God's word, I say, this is where I am. This is the truth. And then I respond appropriately, pull the power back when I'm supposed to, and we come down for a gentle landing, and they say, see, it wasn't so bad after all, was it? I told you, just trust me. And so pilots say, trust your instruments. And so I say, Christian, trust the word of God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You may not feel like you have a spirit of power because you're afraid of so many things, but God's truth says you do have the spirit of power living within you. So stop living and falling back into fear. That's not where you belong. That's not what he has called you to. He's called you to peace in his power that he has worked in us. 1 John 4, 18 says, There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. we got to understand that God loves us, so we're at peace with God. So I'm ready to meet God, because I'm not going to be subject to His wrath or condemnation. So that gives me peace. We've got to trust in God's sovereignty, that He does God perfectly at the perfect time, in the perfect way. And so... I can say, whew, I don't enjoy this flat tire, but this is what God has given me. For what reason, I, know, I don't know, but I don't have to know because I know God is good. He's perfect. His timing is perfect. He wants me to spend my time out here sweating on the side of the road, changing this tire for his purposes. And I just have to trust that. Okay, I'm good with that. Let's move on. Let's, let's change the tire and then see what's next. I'm not being punished. God has loved me. He's proven from the cross of Calvary. He gave his only son. He loves me, so I'm not concerned about being punished. And, and you, mean person, spitting in my face, 
I know why you're doing that. It's not because you hate me. It's because you're scared. Because you're under the fear of death. And you're going to face the wrath of God. And you don't know what else to do but to strike out in anger. And so I'm going to love you. Yes, you may hurt me as I try to love you. But God's not going to allow you to hurt me in the most significant sense until my last day has come. And so I'm confident that I can love you in a way that is in a sense, without risk, because God is with me, and I'm here to share with you this treasure from this jar of clay about the gospel of the Prince of Peace. Freedom from fear. You know, we sang this morning words that John Newton wrote in Amazing Grace. Have you ever thought of it this way? He said, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." So God's grace, when he gave that to you, taught you to fear God in reverential awe and trust. And then the next phrase is, and grace, my fears, relieved. So he taught me to fear God and God alone. And my other fears, grace relieved them because, oh, I've received his favor, and I know him who's working all things together for my good. And so my flesh is tempted to be confused by my circumstances, but the truth of God's word says, you can rest easy. You, you don't have to be anxious because God is working this. That, that mean person that's doing this thing, you may think that he's working all this, but God is the God of that mean person too. God is the God of your circumstances too. And God has got you and God is never going to let you go. You're going to be okay. You may be depressed. You may be having unhealthy thoughts, but let's bring them back out of that pit of, of, of slavery to fear and bring it back into the light of the truth of God's word and let us... Allow grace to relieve our fears. Paul's most common greeting in his letters was, Grace and peace to you. The birthmarks of a Christian. You have it stamped all over you. Grace and peace, they are gifts to you from God. And so we practice this peacefulness by doing the right thing. We think the right way, we do the right things, and then we're ready to proceed peacefully in 2022. Real quick, as we proceed peacefully, this is what I'm thinking about. Luke 150. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. His mercy will be enough for you in 22. Psalm 118, 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? <laughs> Nothing that God doesn't orchestrate and allow and plan. So relax, be at peace. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. God, help me to trust in you in 22. Help me to keep my mind stayed on you, not on my crazy circumstances. I get so dizzy when I focus on my circumstances. They're overwhelming. Help me to turn my eyes to Jesus to look full in his marvelous face so that the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Joshua 1.9, and way back in the Old Testament, he says, Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can't get away from him. He's going to be with you. Jesus said in the New Testament, Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with you always, believer. Peace, be still. Philippians 4, 9, Paul says to us, what you've learned and what you've received and what you've heard and what you've seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Hold on tightly to what is yours, dear believer. The Prince of Peace. 
Father, we rejoice in the gospel good news that you have shared with us this Christmas and always. This year and any year that is in the future will be filled with peace for those who are at peace with God through the Prince of Peace. We want to practice peace by processing life peacefully, thinking on what is true and just and holy and right and excellent and, and commendable. God, give us the strength to practice peace, to do right according to how you've instructed us. If we don't know how you've instructed us, we pray that this year will be the year that you give us a desire for your word, to be committed to daily reading, studying, memorizing, sharing your precious truth. So that, God, we might claim your promise. That we might fulfill the plan to, the command to, to be anxious for nothing in 22. To pray about everything this year. To claim the promise that your peace that surpasses all understanding would guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I say to you, grace and peace, and may that first example be in the upper room as we share fellowship lunch with one another. I'll see you over there. Have a great week.